Hi, everyone. Welcome to Membership Voice. I'm Kero O'Shea, the coordinator of Voice and the host for this evening's webinar. Welcome to everyone, but especially a big welcome to our Rotary International Director, Jesse, joining us tonight. So welcome, Jesse. Thanks, Kero. It's lovely to be here. It's important, though, before going any further, that I acknowledge the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, who are the traditional owners of the land on which I'm hosting tonight's webinar. I acknowledge the strength of their continuing culture and offer my respects to elders past, present and emerging. At this stage, I am delighted to welcome our Zone 8-based Rotary International Director, Dr Jesse Harmon, to present on club building in 2022. Over to you, please, Jesse. Thank you, Caro. It's, it's lovely to be with you. Hello and, and welcome to you all. Um, I was going to sort of do my Maori. Elaine, can you, can you take your microphone off moot for a minute and just give us a little Maori welcome? Oh, okay. Um, kia ora koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto katoa, te hiku, hiku e o mo arotere. Thank you. And, and I will also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I am on tonight, the Wadawurrung people, and pay my respects to past to leaders, past, present and emerging. Can I say, firstly, how lovely it is to see you all? Um, you know, you are, in, you are really the most important people in the room and, and, I'm, and I'm just so appreciative that you've taken time out of your evening or your very early morning, Tom, to, um, to, to, join, to join us this evening. Um, these, these presentations are lovely in real time and it really is nice to have an audience. Um, but they're also a great and rich resource that Caro has um, that, that we can all access. So, so I'm going to speak with you tonight and, and, and I expect that will be about 20, 20 minutes or so and then, then I'll answer any, any questions and really any questions that, that, you, that you want to, to, to ask. And, in fact, I'm probably going to leave you with a question as well so we might have, have, a, bit of a, have a bit of an opportunity for chat. Now, I don't normally use a presentation, but tonight I'm actually going to do it old school. So I'm, I'm going to use a PowerPoint presentation. And if you like the PowerPoint presentation, I'm hoping that you might take it away and start to use it yourself or, or use something like it. So I'll talk about five key things that I think we need to be doing to grow Rotary, um, to, to, to build our clubs, to keep Rotary strong going forwards. And I'm going to share with you some strategies for um, success some of the things that clubs and districts are doing and, and some of the things that I think they should, should be doing. And I'm going to leave you with a bit of a call to action um, because I think, you know, words are one thing, but in fact it's action in the end that will, that will drive us forwards. Now, I don't normally put photos of myself in my presentations, but I want to do it tonight because I want to try and I want to say to you that that I don't just bring my rotary experience to this topic. So some of you will know that I have a PhD and my PhD is in the area of social entrepreneurship broadly, but within that around um, volunteer management um, and, and, and marketing effectively. So a lot of the things that I want to speak with you tonight actually come out of the research on, on volunteering. But the other thing that um, is relevant, I think, is in my professional life, and I've stepped out of it now to do this job, and I might step back into it afterwards, but in my professional life, for the last sort of five years, I oversaw our university's international education. And a key part of that was the recruitment, um, the marketing and recruitment of international students. And we had a lot of international students. And so there is a lot of learning that I can draw from my professional experience and bring into this, this presentation. As I say, please have questions. I'm happy for you to challenge me. I'm old enough and ugly enough for that to happen. Um, and, and we can talk about anything. But 
that that's what I want to do. So I'm bringing my professional life, my research life, my rotary life um, in, into tonight's presentation. The first thing that I think we absolutely need to do is put our members at the centre of our clubs. It is with, with so much choice available to, to volunteers now, we absolutely have to put our members at the centre of our clubs. You know, we need to take more effort to understand each member's needs and their expectations and then we need to deliver a rotary experience that meets their needs. In effect, we need to create more member-centric clubs. Now, I have seen some clubs do this well, and I am certainly aware of other things that we can be doing to make our clubs more member-centric. One of the things is that we can spend much more time in with the prospective member. You know, I like to call this the courting phase, getting to know the prospective member, understanding what they want out of Rotary, helping them understand what Rotary can provide. Um, you'll often hear incoming President Jennifer Jones talk about the importance of, you know, really good induction and mentoring um, and orientation programs that, that, again, help clubs really understand um, members. Um, in, in the club. I think a key to having clubs that are really member-centric is that they are very transparent with decision-making. You know, members understand why decisions are being made um, and, and, and they, get, they get the sort of bigger, bigger picture. And I guess with that is the importance of, you know, really effective communication. Communicate, communicate, communicate. And there's a lot of technology that, 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 there's a lot in technology that can help us do that. I don't know about you, but one of the great challenges in our clubs is often managing the conflicts um, and the tensions that arise between people. And to a degree, they're inevitable. You know, pe people are our lifeblood. Um, but I think to be more member-centric, we can have good systems to prevent and manage conflict and put in place ahead of the conflict wherever, wherever possible. And I think another key part of making our clubs more member-centric is having really regular um, surveys of members so that we're constantly getting feedback from our members about what's working, what's not, what they'd like to do differently. I think it's really important. You know, in the end, we need to create member-centric clubs. You know, we have spent a lot of time trying to make our members fit our clubs. It's now time to make our clubs fit our members. So that's my first area of focus, is, is putting our members at the heart of our Rotary experience. As I think about this, I'm thinking of the Rotary Club of Elizabeth Key, who have done this very well. Caro has a membership voice um, presentation specifically relating to that club and this particular topic, and I certainly uh, encourage you to, to delve into the library and to, to look for that one. So more member-centric clubs. My next area of focus, or the next area of focus, is, is this this incredibly important area of providing meaningful service. You know, you've probably heard me say before that, you know, Rotary International has done survey after survey of our members and said, you know, why, why, do, you, why do you join Rotary? And they say to give back to our communities. And the follow-up question, which is what does that mean, the majority of their members say, I I." I want to give back using my particular skills and experience. You know, we need to provide a, a membership experience, a volunteering experience that is, is meaningful. Not only meaningful for our beneficiaries, but absolutely meaningful for our members. You know, we need to enable members to use their skills and knowledge and we need to seek out projects that actually make a difference. 
But there are some things that, that we can all do to provide meaningful service. You know, one is just simply to, to understand better what skills we have in our club. When was the last time you went to your members and did a skills audit? Or just said, you know, what skills and experience and knowledge do you actually bring to this club? How, how can we use that? You know, it is really important to have a diverse range or portfolio of activities, you know, local and international, big and small, service and fundraising, old and new, you know, as diverse as our members. And similarly with that, we absolutely need to um, be flexible. You know, we need to we need to enable members to contribute in ways that that are personally meaningful. You know, I think the days of the one size fits all are, are well and truly over. I think you know, meaningful also relates to impact and and value. So sort of personal value, but also value to our beneficiaries and our communities. I think we do need to get better at community needs assessments to understand where we really can make an impact. And I have been so impressed by a small number of clubs that have used this lockdown period to really get to know their communities, you know, to plan the things that they can do in advance um, of, of the world opening up again. Again, you're going to hear Jennifer Jones talk a lot about the value of partnering up with other organisations across all our areas of focus. And again, as a way of scaling up our projects and, and increasing our impact. And, and obviously with all of this, you know, we need to, um, we need to value in, engagement as well. And, and again, if I think of some of the membership voice presentations that I've 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 listened to, and I'd like to recommend to you, I, I'm thinking of the Rotary Club of Lindisfarne in Tasmania. They seem to have done this very well, and certainly the Rotary Club of Adelaide in in, in South Australia has has um, has has taken a, a leadership in this in this space. In the end. Volunteers want more flexibility about how and when they volunteer and they want more meaningful volunteering roles. And every report, published report, credible published report into volunteering at the moment comes to this same conclusion, more flexibility and much more meaningful volunteering roles. So that's the second area of focus. The third area of focus you've probably heard me talk about a lot before, and that's the importance of increasing our diversity, equity and inclusion. I think we all recognise that societal values have changed and we no longer tolerate um, exclusivity in, in the way that we used to. And, and so, you know, Rotary has adopted a DEI statement saying that we will value and, and, and welcome all people, you know, regardless of background, expression and identity. And it is about being more representative of the communities that we serve. But, you know, I think fundamentally, more importantly, it's about being true to Rotary. You know, being open, inclusive, fair to all, build goodwill, beneficial to all communities. You know, I think increasing our diversity, equity and inclusion is just absolutely fundamental to Rotary's ongoing um, so, well, survival, I'll be that dramatic. Again, I think, you know, we are all on this learning journey together um, and, and the, 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 the best thing that we can do is raise awareness of the importance of DEI. And lots of you will be in other organisations and other boards and you'll be doing exactly this at, at the same time as we are. Um, we can support members with training, I'm pleased to see districts starting to establish DEI committees. Clubs can certainly do that as well. But I think there comes a point where we also look at the way our clubs operate and say, can we do better? You know, can we make our, our Rotary Club and its operations more, more accessible? You know, I think sometimes the simplest way of thinking about this is just simply developing a culture of appreciation, making sure that everybody in, in Rotary feels like they are welcome um, and, and belong. 
And and again, I've seen a couple of clubs, um, perhaps not so much here, but certainly overseas, who have taken quite concerted efforts to um, understand which communities within their community um, are underrepresented and and sort of partnering and demonstrating relevance to those communities. I don't think you can just go in and say, come join us. I think you've got to say, let us show how being part of Rotary um, actually has, has a benefit. Do you know, in the, in the end, DEI will make us better. You know, increased diversity equates to more diverse thinking styles, better understanding of community problems and better solutions. You know, and if you want to listen to somebody really worth listening to, I know there's a membership voice presentation by Katie Halliday. She's on the DEI task force and, and has oh, the Rotary International DEI task force and, and has some really good um, sensible advice for clubs and districts around increasing DEI. You know, similarly, um, Brisbane International, you know, has, has made some really good, um, taken some really good steps in, in, in this space. So that's, in effect, my third thing that we absolutely need to do. To, to grow Rotary. The, the fourth thing is about developing new clubs and new styles of clubs. And I am absolutely delighted to see that happening in, um, within Rotary and, and within our zone in, in particular. You know, we've had quite a period where we started few new types of clubs, but I sense that we are getting some momentum now. And, you know, I think we are relatively familiar with, with satellite clubs. We've all had a taste of e-clubs. But, you know, it is great to see, you know, the passport clubs that give members a home base and, and let them move around other clubs for service and, and fellowship. I'm loving the alumni clubs that, that mainly have members that are you know, past Rotaractors and Rylearians. Um, similarly, the corporate clubs, um, the, you know, this notion of the Rotary Club of Cheshire Bentley, and Bentley is the motor car company. The employees, uh, the members of that club are mo mostly employees of that company. I, you know, I think of the possibilities that that has for all of us. And we have here in the room Tom Gump, the champion of cause based clubs, you know, and I think they do absolutely represent an opportunity. Now, I'll be interested to see if we can get some environment cause based clubs up that, that are particularly attractive um, for, for new members. I think potentially satellite clubs might provide an option too, particularly in in um, in my. I'm thinking of my district in smaller towns where they can't sustain a whole club. They can't find all the people to take on the leadership roles. Potentially, a satellite club embedded in a bigger host club might have some. Um, traction, and I'm waiting for someone to come to me and say, "Let's let's do Rotary without the club." You know, we're seeing a few examples of that. Great Britain and Ireland sort of developed a hub. Um, you know, there's lots of value on that RI website. I think it's time for us to, to provide a model of participation that's, that's not actually a, a club. And I'm rather hoping that somebody will come to me and say, I'll give it a go. I know it's a bit edgy, but I'll give it a go. Um, I think the other important thing to say in terms of developing new clubs is that we need to support and nurture them once they start. Some will fall over. It's inevitable. But we need to give them the very best opportunity of, of, of working. Some of the things that we are doing, and I know we can do more, you know, I think we can do more to create an appetite for new types of clubs within our Rotary network. I think we need some people with really good creativity um, and imagination to find those gaps and those opportunities, you know, to walk into towns or into buildings and say, why haven't you got a Rotary Club? We do need people that are willing to be the champions. You know, I think this, this is going to be the future of Rotary. And we absolutely do need to allocate funds you know, to make this happen. So for all the would-be district governors in the room today, I think here's, here's an opportunity. And we don't need to do this on our own. You know, there are all sorts of experts out there um, who, who have the know-how to help us, help us do this. 
And as I've said, we do need to support them. But the thing that I want to really say here, and maybe it's in relation to all of this, is that we need to be prepared to fail. You know, we just need to fail, fail fast, take the learnings and then move on. You know, I think, I think, you know, I think we need to be prepared to bite the bullet and have a go. I, I do think these new types of clubs are just a hugely important bridge to our future. And I, and I want to say to you, these new types of clubs, they won't weaken Rotary. You know, instead, they're going to enable us to engage with a whole host of people who will not and cannot join our conventional clubs, but do nevertheless want to be part of, of Rotary's amazing impact. You know, if I wanted to go and learn more about this, I would certainly go into the Membership Voice Library. Um, I'd look for the Rotary Club of South Bank. There's a really nice presentation about the satellite clubs that they've established. And again, um, Nick Lim's presentation for Elizabeth Keyes is, is very, very important. So I'm going to summarise them, but that, that's, that's my number four. And, and my number five is, is this one. You know, we can do all of the things that I've said, but if we don't actually ask people to join us, it, it will come to naught. So we absolutely do need to invite members um, and new members to join us. And, you know, this is where I think I bring my um, international education and recruitment, marketing and recruitment um, experience to the fore here because we do have to be systematic about how we bring members in. You know, we do, we do have to take a planned approach. You know, we do have to know who we're targeting. We absolutely know, need to know what are, what's the offer we're making to prospective members, you know, what they should, you know, what's the offer and why, why they should join us. And I think we have to help our members be better um, ambassadors, ambassadors and advocates. That's a hard conversation for some of our members to have. And we do need to think about... Um, the best promotion efforts. And, and I have been delighted to hear people talking about, you know, really effective websites that have been, um, that have been, been a useful um, tactic for bringing in new members, you know, content marketing, a whole range of new and exciting things that we can do now with technology as a, as a way of bringing in members. The other thing that I want to pick up on this slide is this following up with prospective members and making it personal. And I think we're all a bit guilty sometimes of asking once and then leaving it there, particularly if we get a no or something that we that we think sounds like a no. But we we absolutely need to make it personal. We need to we need to follow up with prospective members, not once, maybe not even twice, but but you know, more times if necessary. The other thing that we should do is we should keep reminding our members of why it's important that they renew their membership. You know, I think we're guilty of just sending out an invoice and, and leaving it there. So we should be getting better at, at communicating the value to existing Rotarians as well. And as part of that, we absolutely need to, um, you know, do whatever we can to tell our stories and, and strengthen our community presence. So in the end, if we haven't got members, we are absolutely nothing, and and there is there is nothing 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 more that we can say, and, and we know that. So let me just finish, and then I then I'll be quiet, and you can you can talk to me. My call to action is: we have to find a way to put this squarely on everybody's agenda. And my question to you is: how do we do that? I think we all have a sense of what we need to do, but how do we actually put it? front and centre and make it happen. We do need to do these five things that I've talked about. We need to put our members at the heart of the club experience. We need to provide opportunities for meaningful service. We need to increase diversity, equity and inclusion and find opportunities to start new clubs and particularly new types of clubs. And we absolutely need to invite people to join us. We need to be great storytellers. There is absolutely no doubt about that. And most importantly, we need to deliver positive and lasting change. I mean, I do love that Paul Harris quote, you know, no matter how the world, you know, no matter how we know ourselves to the world, we'll be known by the, by the results we deliver. 
and I think that's the most important thing. And just because he invited me to do this, I'm going to end with a plug for Membership Voice for Caro. So, Caro, you do wonderful work. You've got a rich library of resources for all these wonderful member champions. Thank you very much for having me and, and everyone, I hope you will subscribe to Membership Voice. Thank you, Jesse, and thank you for that huge plug at the end. That's absolutely fantastic. Jesse, I want to open with a, a question I've received uh, that, that I've had come through the chat line. It's one that I was planning to ask anyway, and it gets back to this issue of clubs being member-centric rather than members fitting into, I think as Mark puts it, a, a, a square peg in a round hole kind of thing. And there's this ugly word I think is really ugly when you apply it to human beings, and that's poaching. We have this stuff that the scoundrels in Rotary would put around the place that if someone goes to a better club, gets to get a better experience, they've been poached. Isn't it time that we put that, that we put that term and the uh, and the thinking that goes with it in, in the dustbin of history? What do you oh. think? Well, absolutely. I would only entertain poached if it came with eggs. I mean, in the end, people have a million choices now about how they spend their time, not only in volunteering but across the board. People will go where they get the best value for their, for their dollar. And I would far rather see somebody go to another Rotary Club than to lose them to the network altogether. Yeah. And I think it's the same argument that you use when, when a club gets nervous about another, another type of club getting started. I think there is room enough for all of us. And I think in the end, as long as Rotary is the winner, we are all winners. Thank um, you, Jesse. Yeah. Jesse, I, at this stage I'm going to invite uh, I'm going to invite Ewan Miller to put his question about SRF. Over to you, please, Ewan. Thanks, Jesse. That was a great presentation. Thanks, uh, Ewan. I understand that you're not particularly enamoured with shaping Rotary's future. Um, I'm, I don't, I've heard this secondhand, so I'm not sure if that's correct or not, but um, I just wondered if, if that is correct. Uh, would you like to sort of explain why? Because, I mean, that's sort of one of the ways of growing Rotary. I, I will explain why. It's not exactly correct, Ewan. I, I think growing Rotary, I think there are two issues that we need to address to grow Rotary. Predominantly, the way that we will grow Rotary is by improving the experience in clubs. It's the product that we sell. That is where I think we will get best traction in growing Rotary. I'm not yet convinced that just by changing our administrative structure, which is districts, we will, in fact, impact our membership. But you and I want to say to you, we need both. The most important thing, the area where we will get immediate results is by focusing on the product that we sell, which is membership of Rotary in, my, in, in clubs. And that is where my heart is. There is another group of people who, who, who strongly think we need to change the administration, and I think you and they are probably right. You know, just between you and me and everyone in else in the room, I think we could do most of the Shaping Rotary's future things without going right to the extent that that model, um, that model requires. But, but I do think we need to change our product, strengthen our product, and I think you and probably we need to change our governance model, which is what Shaping Rotary's Future is about, you know, at the same time. I am enamoured of the change, Ewan. I'm a bit of a pragmatist. I'd rather be doing stuff now and getting it happen. But if needs be, I will support it because I am determined to have Rotary here in 100 years' time. And if we have to throw all the balls up in the air, so be it. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Jesse. Thanks, Ewan. Over to... In terms of disc, you know, being member centric, uh, when we do have a significant disconnect, over to Sarah Hill for a question. 
Hi, Jesse. Um, Hi, I'm Sarah. Sarah from 9670, as you know, soon to be a new, very, very big district in New South Wales. And I'm also part of the DEI committee. And we're coming across this problem that ideally, yes, a lot of these things we're talking about are fantastic and moving forward and what some want. But if we go by your first point of member-centric, and sticking with the members we currently have. In northern New South Wales, we have a huge disconnect between what Rotary members actually are and are thinking versus almost everything you've said here and everything I believe and want Rotary to be. How do we, how do we resolve that? Sarah, I just completely empathize and validate your comments. I mean, I think it is an incredibly challenging road to take, yet I think it is the right road to take. Um, part of me thinks of, is it Steve Jobs' favourite statement? You know, if, if I left it to, to the customers to tell me what they wanted, nothing would ever get de <laughs> developed. Um, do you know, Sarah, I think it's a long road. It is a long road and it's got to be a road built on education and information and and understanding and and I don't have all the answers at all I, I think the only thing that I can ask you or suggest is to reach out to as many resources for help as you can you know invite guest speakers maybe it is a bit softly softly and it'll never happen as quickly as we want but Sarah I do think it's really important and I do know it's really hard and you know and if we can connect you to resources to make it in any way easier, please don't don't hesitate to reach out. You're absolutely right. Sarah, and thanks, Jesse. Jesse, I've had, had another question come through about something that is probably central to our DEI strategy, and that's improving the uh, improving our recruitment of women, including the experience that women get in Rotary. And I realise this is a very, very broad range, but there's a very pretty uh, cogent sort of argument that if we do that, then that in itself is going to, to improve our DEI performance across the board. What are your thoughts in that area? What, what can we do? Do you know, I think, I mean, I think we should absolutely strive for gender diversity, you know, and, and I, for one, will be pleased when gender is off the agenda. I don't think it will happen until we are, you know, at 50-50. At, at, at I, think, I, think, I think we need to, we need to, um, I think we need to recognise the progress we've made. I think we need to recognise there's more progress left to be made. I think we need to make sure that we're actively supporting women in our clubs to become presidents because once you've been president, it becomes easy to be district governor and, 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 and we need men and women to open doors for women and I'm incredibly thankful for the, for the men who have opened doors um, for me. I mean, RI has set targets around women in leadership roles um, at 30% on the way to 50%. Um, we just need to keep making it happen. I think women join Rotary for the same reasons that men do, um, and I think we just need to continue to to, to support and nurture and sponsor, um, and maybe and maybe listen. Thanks, Jesse. A question about our youth programs. As we've lost districts, mm -hmm. so we've also lost a number of programs that have that have serviced communities, for example, as we see populations increase, the number of, number of young people who benefit from our youth programs is increasing, but the number of programs is declining with the decline in the number of districts. Our youth programs, I think, are different from some of the others because we could actually use those to, as part of our, actively use those as part of, through traineeships and the like, to develop future or develop, to develop young leaders. What's your perspective on that? I, I believe that Rotary's youth programs are our flagship programs. 
I don't accept that reduction in district numbers mm. yeah. needs to lead to diminution of youth programs. I am concerned that the pandemic has made it incredibly difficult for clubs and districts to maintain their youth programs. But I think we absolutely have to. How can we demonstrate that we are relevant if we are not impacting on, on young people? So I know that it's hard um, and I know that it comes with another layer of regulation and, 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 and policy, but these young people are our future leaders and if we cannot demonstrate our relevance to them then I wonder why why we're in business now please understand I speak as a past Rylerian so you know I, I I ashamedly have a bias but I listen to those people who come up to me in the street and say I went on youth exchange it changed my life it is absolutely the most affirming thing I ever hear. And I hear it about all sorts of programs. I am yet to find a young person that doesn't come back from Rylar and say that was just the most amazing experience I've ever had. So I implore all clubs and districts to re-find their energy and in their enthusiasm when it comes to young people um, because I do think they're our future um, and Rotary's future as well. That's by way of a follow-up, and this is a bit of a plug. We actually ran a trial with a little a traineeship in a couple of clubs where in return for uh, those placements on, and bear in mind that we've got three flagship, at least three flagship uh, young adult programs, Ryla, Riley and Ryla Oceania, we got, actually got the potential there to string together a three-year traineeship or scholarship, or, or think of it as you will, uh, to get people, act, young people actively involved with clubs. Yeah. So anyway, that's that's the plague. That's the plague. I, I was reading a research a volunteering report the other day and it was about how clubs go and make themselves really successful. And there was a couple, there was a couple of really nice stories that had cl the clubs, in fact, they were football clubs um, mm -hmm. in, in the UK that had gone to local universities and brought in teams of students doing marketing and commerce and various things, you know, and used their expertise but also built that relationship over time. And I'm loving, Caro, people telling stories in their chat and just c connecting to help each other because, in fact, you know, that's probably the most important resource that we have, each other. Yeah. I, next thing, it's an interesting question that came through about leadership because leadership has come into a, into a very strong focus in Rotary uh, where, where we've been told, and with, with some good reason, that we don't have a membership problem, we have a leadership problem. Would you care to offer your perspective on that, please, Jesse? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I mean, there are many different ways to be leaders. Um, I think. I think we have a membership problem because we have. I think we have a membership pro pro problem because we're at that point in our trajectory where um, consumers' needs and expectations are changing. You know, what they want out of volunteering is changing and we are still playing catch-up. If that's a leadership problem, I, I might buy it, but I'm not convinced it's as simple as that. It sounds like a good tagline, <laughs> um, but we do need great leadership. You know, and I often say to the governors, your district will survive in spite of you, but it will be great because of you. And there is no doubt that when you get a great leader and there are some great, I mean, you're all great leaders and there are some really, you know, great leaders in the room I can see. You know, we need people. Um, we need people to be great leaders. Um, and But we do, but we have a membership problem for different reasons as well, Caro. It's not just about leadership. Life isn't that simple, is it? No, and no. Yeah, I do have a question here from Bob Calvert. So, Bob, would you like to unmute and put your question to, to uh, Jesse? Yes, thanks, Caro. Hi, Jesse, and everybody Hi, else. I'm, I've just come off eight days of International Assembly, so I think I'm a little bit brain dead. 
Um, one of the things that uh, I've taken particular notice of over my relatively long career in Rotary is that we do have a major disconnect between the uh, younger generations coming through uh, the, the schooling system, especially through the secondary schools. Now, I know we've got Interact, but I don't believe that we've used Interact anywhere near well enough. We've got one, possibly two clubs here down in Tasmania um, that have supported Interact and it's worked very, very well. I tell the story of uh, in my career of uh, um, being part of um, the minerals industry in Tasmania uh, after a very large survey found that the, um, the worst place in Australia that understood or didn't like mining was indeed Launceston. But Launceston, in fact, had been founded on the mining industry. And rather than try and beat everybody up because they had their opinions, we decided that we'd start with the youth. Now, that was 25 years ago. And those youth today are the young mums and dads or definitely getting into that sphere of being at least aware and have a much more greater understanding. So if we do that with our schools and at least get them aware of what it is to do service in the community through Interact, I believe we're on a, a long way because um, there is this disconnect I see. Um, and I go back also a number of years ago, um, the Apex organisation used to, um, their members had to leave by the time they were 40. They still wanted to do service and it was a wonderful think tank um, for, um, for to become Rotarians. Um, I, I don't believe the Apex uh, movement's very, very strong, if at all now. So we've lost that big gap. So the best way to do that is to get youth understanding what it is to do service through becoming and being involved with Interact. And then even if they do drop out, we still have that platform of, of uh, RyPen. We have the... Uh, also the Ryla and so forth, but at least they are more aware of it than hearing it secondhand. Yeah. So that's my couple of bobs worth. Bob, I, I mean, I think financial institutions are masters of products that go from cradle to the grave. You know, I think we absolutely could have, you know, other other products in our product kit from Rotor Kids, Interact, Rotor Act, Rotary. Now I could start a rumour. Wouldn't mind Probus in there as well, quite frankly. Um, but, you know, we, we, we can do this. But uh, we, we, we mustn't forget uh, our opportunities to connect with young people. Thank you. A question here from Tony Allstop. So over to you, please, Tony. Thanks, Caro, and great to see you again, Jess. Yes, um, Tony. We, we have great stuff developed by PR and PI on websites and Facebook and all those sort of uh, media. I consider that the cart. I see marketing as the horse that drives the cart, getting people directed to those places. We don't seem to have marketing teams, though. Why don't we have marketing? Mm. That's, that's an interesting observation, isn't it? And it's probably something to do with the way that we compartmentalise, you know, membership, public image, foundation. Tony, back to you. What's, what's one thing that you would do to solve that problem? <laughs> well, form, form a marketing team um, or find somebody, as a, get them in as a member who has those marketing skills. I can, I can give you one example. I asked in district about a welcome to your area uh, pack or pamphlet that you could give real estate agents for people moving into your area. I have yet to find any within our district who has that anything for real estate agents. Mm. Why not? That's mm. a great source of new members. Yeah. Yeah. 
And the real estate agent in my club is an absolute master at bringing new members into the club. You know, there is no doubt that some people have those skills beautifully. Tony, you've given us some good food for thought. Thank you. Thanks, Jess. Jesse Harmon, why are you in Rotary? Kara, I'm, I'm in Rotary because it has given me the most amazing opportunities, you know, N not only as a young person to develop myself in Ryla, but I joined at 32. You know, through Rotary, I've, I've led teams, I've led projects, I've learned to do budgets. I've got a, a network of connections that I've made right around the world now. And I get to do all of that and feel like, you know, in some sort of tiny way, I, I'm, I'm leaving a legacy. You know, I'm giving back to community and, and supporting others to, to, to do the same. I mean, I had no idea when, you know, Rosie King came to me when I first came to Ballarat and said, will you join Rotary? I had no idea that it would be, a, you know, a life-changing opportunity. And without wanting to proselytise, it, it really has been. You know, I, I know exactly why I'm in Rotary. Thank and you, you all that. inspire me, and that's why I stay in Rotary. We're going to acknowledge what I think has been a, a fabulous presentation and some great follow-up conversations by a marvellous Rotarian. So on that note, if you'd like to join me, please, in a round of applause for our Rotary International Director. Well done, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for having me. Go and have a wine. Join your families. Go to bed. Whatever you need to do. Thanks, everyone, and good night.